Welcome to episode 179 of the Sibling Dream Podcast. This is the first podcast dedicated to helping sibling dream professionals succeed in both work and life. And in this episode of the podcast, which is part of our Women in Civil Engineering series, I'm talking to Hannah Albertus Benham, a senior water resources and environmental engineer at Wood, about the challenges of working in a highly scientific project with real impacts to a community and how teamwork, communications, and collaboration can be harnessed to make that project successful. I'm your host for today's episode. I'm Chris Knutson. I'm a chartered and professional civil engineer coming to you from my home base somewhere in the lovely Oxfordshire England countryside. And with that, let's go ahead and just dive right into episode 179 of the Civil Engineering Podcast with Hannah Albertus Benham. All right, everyone, now it's time for the Civil Engineering Conversation of the Week, and I am here with Hannah. Hannah, welcome to the uh, Civil Engineering Podcast. How are you today? Great. Thanks for having me so much. Yeah, no, it's wonderful to have you here. So the uh, the listeners for the show will have a chance to read your background and, and bio and other materials on the show notes uh, for the for the podcast, but, but it's always useful just, you know, it's one thing to read it, but it's also another thing to actually hear it. From the individual, so would you mind just sharing with our listeners a little bit about you know what do you do on a daily basis, and you know where do you focus your 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 uh, your energies uh, on your day to day job? Sure. Yeah, so I've I've been uh, leading a team um, from Wood, providing technical support to the state of Minnesota here, um, and and what we're doing is helping them and the communities in the East Metro of the Twin Cities um, that have been impacted by PFAS contamination, um, helping them to plan for the future um, for their drinking water supply. So there's 14 communities that we've been uh, working with along with the state um, agencies and, and other groups and stakeholders. Um, and basically for wood, we've been supporting them technically. So providing, um, you know, drinking water and PFAS expertise along, along the way. So it's been about a, a three year process now. Um, and my day to day work kind of consists of attending a lot of meetings, um, to discuss all different kinds of things from technical approaches to scheduling and deadlines and, progress updates and a lot of quality checking and writing and reviewing and um, et cetera. <laughs> so um, I also kind of, I, I heard cats a lot. Um, so I'm the project manager and uh, essentially acting as the liaison between our, our technical team of engineers and scientists and, and with the client, which is the, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, so. Okay. Yeah, well, um, you gave your hands full with that one because uh, <laughs> like you said that you know hurting cats because I think right <laughs> you know, the, the work of um, yeah you know what I've found and I'd be kind of curious of your thoughts on this I found and often cases the technical aspects are maybe the least least challenge challenging in a project right. you know it's yeah. and in this case you're interacting with with communities which mm -hmm. which uh, obviously um, especially in the issue of PFAS. Can be, uh, I think, uh, kind of an emotionally charged issue when you start talking about sure. some drinking water. Um, so, some of our listeners, no doubt, will be familiar with PFAS, PFOA, the forever chemicals. But I, could you just maybe for for some of our listeners who, you know, who are in the civil engineering environment or are listening here today, but don't really understand what what that acronym is and what it what it is, can you maybe just share a little bit about what you know what is PFAS and then more importantly, maybe what's the issue? I mean, why, why are the communities concerned about this? Why should any of us be concerned about it? Yeah, well, that's a loaded question, but I'll try. <laughs> um, so PFAS stands for uh, per and poly polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, it's a group of chemicals and there's, I think, uh, you know, maybe over 6,000 of them so far that we know of that have been manufactured um, over the years. And that's, that's been going on since um, even dating back to like the 1940s. Um, so it's one of those things that's kind of been around for a long time, but, uh, you know, wasn't really well understood as far as its uh, in, impacts to human health, ecology, um, and the environment. So 
so what happened is, you know, in the, you know, kind of in the nineties, I want to say is when, um, you know, folks, scientists, um, chemical engineers and such from, from different manufacturers started to kind of recognize that, you know, maybe there was some impacts. And so I think it, it kind of grew from there where it kind of expanded into the environmental uh, and risk assessment world where they, they finally started to kind of start to study it. And now are, are understanding more and more that um, that does have impacts on, on human health. And so that's been documented pretty thoroughly now by EPA and, um, you know, other groups like the uh, ASTDR, I think is the acronym. Don't ask me what that stands for. <laughs> Not going to be able to recall that offhand, but um, so, so they do the, the toxicology uh, studies for the EPA and, and kind of come out with, with all that technical info and, and background information and actually just uh, release some new information that you can find on the EPA website on, on PFAS. But um, so yeah, it's, it's an emerging contaminant. And um, so we're, we're doing our best to try to stay on top of it, stay on top of the science um, and make sure that, that folks are protected. So um, when it comes to the East Metro and the contamination, um, you know, east of the Twin Cities there, um, that's uh, due to some legacy um, dumping sites. So, so sites where um, the chemical manufacturer has uh, in the past, you know, uh, put their waste materials. And so that's been slowly leaching into the groundwater in the East Metro and it has pretty extensive effect on, on the groundwater um, aquifers there uh, where folks in that area get their drinking water. Okay, so. okay. So, and so I appreciate that because that kind of sets the stage for everyone that's listening and, and you know, kind of what the, what the issue is. I, I'd be kind of curious because you touched a little bit on, you know, on the, on the, you know, the work that you're doing with all these different communities um, east of, east of the Twin Cities. If maybe you could just, you know, kind of unpack for us a, a bit more about what this, you know, what that work entails, because I, I, I would imagine that there's, in this again is just, you know, kind of guessing as you're talking through this particular issue, but there's probably some there's probably monitoring involved in that. There's, there maybe there's remediation activities are in there, but to be curious, if you could just maybe unpack for us the, you know, what's involved in the work that that you're actually, you know, that you're actually delivering and interfacing with uh, with on these communities. So there's you know kind of this growing environmental awareness that's brought a short, sharper focus and a need to take better care of our planet and resources just more more broadly. Um, so this project is kind of an example of us, you know, supporting um, and finding solutions to create a cleaner and protected, more protected environment. Um, and, and we're working with the state of Minnesota. They, they sued the manufacturer and, and had a, a settlement. Um, and so there's this, this fund that's out there um, and that was reached in 2018. And so from there, then the state started kind of building a plan, um, working with another consultant that works primarily on, on the national resources damages claims, um, which is what that the settlement was, um, the first ever PFAS NRDC settlement. Um, and so they worked with that consultant for a while and determined that there was this need for, for technical support, um, not only um, in the, for peace, PFAS specific experience, but also um, on the drinking water side of things. So, so infrastructure treatment and that kind of thing. Um, so when, so we were brought in late 2018 um, to, to help with that and to provide that technical expertise. So, so we're kind of helping them to navigate this emerging contaminant um, and, and helping to, you know, provide education to the communities and to the, the stakeholders that are involved. They had um, two work groups set up. One is, um, consists of the members of the community and businesses. Um, and then the other one is more um, of the, um, the city's, the community's leadership. Um, so these, these two, two work groups um, have been working in tandem throughout this process. Um, and so, you know, they had concerns, they had a lot of uh, questions, um, they brought a lot to the table. Um, and it was really important for us to give them, um, 
you know, to help with this, this conceptual plan that ultimately we're working towards um, a drinking water supply plan um, and to give them something that they could be proud of, that they could take ownership in um, because they've really been instrumental throughout this process. So um, we wanted them to, you know, at the end of the day, when we have this plan in hand to feel like it's their plan, to feel like, feel confident um, and to feel like they were in the best hands possible. So, so it was kind of our job to provide that expertise and provide that um, level of comfort almost to, to these stakeholders. Yeah, and, and I want to come back to that in just a minute because I mean that to me is a has to be it has had to have been just a challenge to get through, again because it's you know just from experiences and, and things that I think a, a lot of a lot of us civil engineers will have read or even heard in the news. You know, with, you know I'm thinking back to like the um, you know the, the lead in the water systems in, in Flint, Michigan, and some of the other uh, major issues like that that have come up around the uh, the um, you know, the susceptibility of our of our of our drinking water, um, not only just the aquifers, but the actual systems themselves. So I, I can only imagine the, um, you know, obviously the level of interest that the community itself has had uh, on the, uh, you know, on the on the really the um, sustainability of that natural resource. What I want to touch on, though, because it's you, you brought up a lot of different components that I think are such an so important. Um, you know, really in any any program that's being delivered or any any um, especially technically challenging project that that has interface with a with a local community and, and kind of a wider populace. Um, and that was talking about how, you know, in your day to day job, you're interfacing with everyone from, you know, from from, you know, very scientific, technical individuals who are, you know, are really into the science, if you will, of of PFAS and the chemicals and what's going on with that, you know, no, like you're probably dealing with, you know, environmental engineers, you've got civil engineers involved, you've got the stakeholder, you've got all these different people that bring in different perspectives, um, a very you know diverse array of individuals. I'd be really curious to hear from you, you know, your perspectives on how having that diversity has helped. And, and then maybe on the opposite of that, maybe even provided you with some challenges um, in getting to a conceptual plan uh, and the different stages that you're going through and what you've learned from that journey. So there's a bunch of stuff I just put into that question. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, so it's really kind of, you know, what's what's been good about the diversity, what hasn't been good about all that diversity and, right. and you know, what are the lessons that maybe you've drawn so far from, from this journey? Yeah. So we had a really, really great team, number one, working on this project um, throughout the process. So it's been about a three year process um, and a lot of careful consideration, you know, looking at big picture ideas, but really when it comes down to it, there's a lot of details that go into this. Even though we're working on a conceptual plan, we had to work, you know, hands-on, one-on-one, um, and really, you know, that, that's what allowed us to, to gain the confidence of, of the communities and, and the folks, the stakeholders that were involved. Um, it really couldn't have been possible without, without the team. Um, you know, a lot of knowledgeable expertise and, and dedication um, as we kind of all grew and learned through the process. Um, but we are all, you know, focused on that commitment to deliver um, to deliver, you know, the the final plan, and so um, we we collaborated a lot um, internally, um, and that kind of you know allowed us all to kind of embrace everyone's different skills. And I think that that diversity of skills is really important when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, the more backgrounds and and lived experiences that you have on your team, um, particularly for projects with such engaged stakeholders. Um, you're more prepared. And so it's not just technical, like you said, you have to be able to relate to them, to, um, you know, the situation and the people um, on a personal level. So for instance, you know, we had mothers with young children that would come into meetings and be concerned that they haven't had safe drinking water, perhaps in the past, that it's, you know, kind of now just coming to light. Um, or, and, you know, there were generations of families in some cases who've lived there their whole life, um, you know, wondering 
you know, if they're safe or if they're going to have issues down the line because of this. Um, you can't just bra brush these types of things off because they're just because they're not technical experts, their voice and opinion has value and you always have to, uh, you don't always have to do what they say, but you have to learn from their viewpoint. And, um, and once you can take that kind of all into consideration, um, you can lead better communications. You can have better strategies in the future, for instance. Yeah, well, and that, and that leads me to, to, you know, to the kind of the next question, which is around that communications piece, because because you're you you know you know having a conversation with with a group of a group of engineers um, or technically backgrounded individuals who understand um, you know, understand what PFAS is understand you know um, you know water flow and, and the different aspects that we you know that we as engineers are going to be able to understand um, you know just like you mentioned you're you're in you, in often cases it sounds like you're interfacing with individuals who don't have that understanding. Uh, who don't have a technical background, and so being able to communicate that that information, take data, take hard engineering information, turn that into a product that, you know, a non-technical person would be able to understand, sounds like it was a bit of a challenge, uh, and, and certainly, um, certainly uh, probably led to a lot of late, um, you know, late working evenings as you were kind of going through this. So, you know, what kind of what kind of recommendations? do you have or would be willing to share on, on what that looked like and maybe some, what are some of the things that you learned going through that process? Sure. Um, yeah, so the, um, I guess for me, explaining technical information is sort of a process. So uh, I, I tend to like to listen a lot and, and take in, uh, you know, what I'm hearing and the feedback that we're getting um, from my colleagues, from the stakeholders, or whatever the case may be, um, but you know, kind of starting with with the the technical information, and then trying to gain this higher level understanding, um, and then after taking that in, kind of repeating it back out to the technical staff to to make sure that you know I'm I'm assessing it from a high level, but still getting all the facts straight. Um, so kind of repeating it back to them, plain language, make sure that the content is still accurate in its simplest form. Um, and then add visuals as much as possible. <laughs> um, you know, that was a, that was an important part uh, for sure. Um, but, you know, then at the end of the day, you have to go and, you know, be and interact with these people, the stakeholders and, and the work group members and, um, and then you're sort of inviting this feedback. Um, and that can be terrifying <laughs> um, as part of a communication piece, like you know, opening up your engineering diary for the world to see. Um, you know, because it's it's a lot of detailed information um, that's important for them to understand so that you know we can all move forward with this collective understanding. Um, so you have to kind of remind yourself that we're all there for the same goal, despite you know, opposing opinions maybe of how we get there. Yeah. Um, but it takes courage and it takes an open mind. Um, people are going to disagree. You're going to be wrong <laughs> in some cases, you know, it, throughout the, I mean, it's been a three year process. So of course we've found errors and, and tweaks and things like that. So, and someone might have a better idea than what you thought of, even if they're not technical. Um, and you need to be ready for that. And you need to be ready, ready to kind of pivot and modify and refine and, and so that's kind of the scientific process, right? You know, and it should be kind of honored in that way. We have to embrace any, any changes that come our way. We can't just be stuck in the mud. So that being said, I think um, the goal that I mentioned, um, you know, ultimately getting to this conceptual plan and, um, and a safer environment in the future and safer drinking water um, is really important. And one of the challenges we face is is when to kind of rein that in then. So we're, we're putting together all this technical information and we're kind of going towards this goal of, of determining what our plan is and kind of fine tuning that. But at some point we have to be done with the plan too. Um, and so you can't just con keep continuing to refine and refine and refine because that'll just go on forever. So that's the other challenge is, is knowing when to rein it in then. And, um, kind of end that conceptual process in order to make way for implementation. 
Sure. So that's where we're headed now. We're we're really close. Well, that's good. Yeah. When well, you're right, I mean, at some point, at some point, there's always got to be a you know target end date. Otherwise, otherwise it could be the, the, there's the, been many the, targets uh, that have been set over the years. Yeah. Uh, it's been a process for sure. No doubt. Well, you know, as you've gone through that process, I mean, you. you you know, in the comments you just shared, there's a couple things that I keyed in on. Because again, I, I think in this one, you know, when, you know, a lot of us will be involved in project design teams, will be involved in, uh, you know, charrettes or planning reviews, design reviews, whatever they may be. And it's, again, it's all engineers or project delivery type people that are associated with that, maybe contractors or clients that have client side representatives that are in there that understand, again, engineering. As soon as you bring in you know, individuals who, you know, from, from, let's say from a wider audience, um, the public <laughs> specifically, uh, you know, it can become very, you know, I can see where it can become very, um, you know, very challenging. And, and, and even for, you know, even for individuals who are, who feel very confident in doing public speaking and having interface and being able to get up in front of an audience of technical peers and present items to them, it can be uh, daunting because I, I even for myself I can only Im imagine um, the level of anxiety going into those types of uh, environments because because you, you don't know what you're going to get in return. Um, not focusing so much on 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 the preparation for that. I'm curious to hear from you because anyone who's in a leadership role uh, and is involved even in project management, you know, I think it's important for for them and it's, it's the same for myself to have it you know, really kind of trusted, trusted advisors that we can go to mentors or whoever it may be that we can bounce things off of and go, Hey, how do I handle this? I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, as you've gone through this journey over the, over the past years, did you have, you know, what was your support network like? Because I can only imagine in some of these meetings, especially with the public where, you know, they, it, there had to be anxiety as you went into those. So just, you know, are you willing to share with us? Like, you know, did you have that kind of a support network you could share? Or did you find yourself like I'm out here on the end of this limb and I just hope everything kind of works out? No, um, our, our team was really great and, and really was the support network. Um, a lot of the, the team are, are senior engineers or senior um, hydrogeologists, for instance. Um, and so they, you know, I'm, I'm definitely able to draw from, from them quite a bit and um, and I think that, that that's important to have that support there. And, you know, before COVID, <laughs> we had, we had in-person meetings once a month um, and, and our staff um, from other parts of the country would actually fly in to be there. So we not only had that support behind the scenes, but physically there in person. And, and a lot of times, you know, we'd be passing the mic around the room and um, you know, whatever anybody had to offer, or, um, you know, Shalene was there. <laughs> she, my colleague Shalene, um, she's, she's our, our PFAS um, program manager uh, for the company, our global PFAS program manager. And so she, she was definitely a big part of the process early on and, and helped to really was um, another, you know, source of support in that process. That's great. Yeah, uh, it, it, I mean, it's good that you obviously had had that kind of a support network because, and I think it also highlights the fact that that each of us, as we go through, you know, go through this journey in our careers, you know, we 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 enter into projects that sometimes and even programs that can be challenging. Um, the importance of being able to have that, you know, that network of support around, you know, around you, and 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 really understanding and realizing that you're not a it's not a, a, a one person show as you're going through, you've got to have that support. And that's oh yeah. I'm... And they were, they were also presenting too. I wasn't the only one up in front of people. <laughs> Which is good. Yeah. Share the, share the, uh, share the wealth or the blame. Yeah. Which really are exactly. the Absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, Hannah, you've got to, you know, have had a, a really amazing career and, and being involved in this area is a very, you know, specialized area. I'd be, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you the, you know, kind of the question about, you know, what kind of advice can you give? Because this, because this show really part of the, you know, part of the things that we do in the Citizen Engineering Podcast is really also around being able to share insight for others who are listening. Going, you know, that's an area I really want to get into. So, I'd be curious to maybe just share like what are some of your thoughts about what 
um, a young woman that's in civil engineering that's coming in that is interested in having a career similar to yours, what are some of the things that they want to they want to keep in mind as they go through to, to kind of prep them for it? Yeah, I I work with a lot of of really great women. Um, I'm lucky to work in a company where, um, in fact, my manager has always been a woman <laughs> since I've started with with wood. Um, and so I think I work with a lot of fantastic women and men, of course. Um, but I'm encouraged to see more and more women in leadership. I think that's really important um, and really something that um, it, it kind of, you know, I hate to use the term glass ceiling, but it, it does kind of like break that barrier for you a little bit as you're coming up in, in engineering or whatever, you know, whatever um, type of work that you do. So for me, um, I think I, one thing that I can say is that I, I tend to um, identify with the concept about um, kind of honing in a little bit here, but um, women tend to hesitate, I would say, second guess, uh, doubt themselves or what they're doing or whatever. I think that that's one of the barriers that I've found that um, that's the most difficult and, and maybe most prevalent um, that I can say that, uh, you know, if you want something, you have to ask for it, right? Yes. You, you can't, you can't just, um, you know, kind of continue on and expect, you know, things to just fall at your lap, obviously. But I think women in particular have been a little more hesitant, you know, they, they possess that, that hesitation for a reason has kind of been ingrained in us. Um, but that's something that's, that's hard to break through sometimes, but it's really important to do that because, because you need to be, um, you need to be present. You need to be at the table, um, and you have to do it. You can't hesitate. I, I think that's a barrier that's hindered the progress of women in engineering and in business in general. Um, and we're not inferior by any means there, but there has been this fundamental perception um, for centuries, you know, um, that we are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so we're that's, that's a hard thing to break through. Um, and we will overcome and we're, we're getting there. But um, I think in STEM is definitely one of those areas where we can improve. So I feel like, you know, just don't hesitate. Yeah, that <laughs> you way can't it's... hesitate. You, you really have to, um, you know, push, push through and, and put yourself out there. Um, because if you don't, somebody else will. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and that's great, great advice. And uh, very similar to what, you know, I share with my, uh, with my daughter as well, which is the answer, the answer is no, unless you ask. And it may still be no, but at least you've asked and you've got to, you know, you exactly. need to, if it's something you want, you're going to have to go after it because nobody's going to hand it to you. So it's a, a, a great, great advice. I think not just in the, I would, I would apply it beyond even just the engineering career. It's pretty much everything, yeah. you know, one does in your life is uh Absolutely. Is just, just just do it i think i've heard that right. before. all right well hannah this has been a, a great conversation i really appreciate you spending you know spending some time with us uh sharing your insights uh, not only about the about the great work that you're doing with this with this team up in uh up in minnesota but um also your you know some of your experiences you've had and and you know and your insight um we're going we're gonna to come back in just a moment for the uh, Civil Engineering Hot Seat, and, uh, and we'll get a chance to hear a little bit more about, about you personally and some of the great things that you do just to you know, kind of keep yourself at the, uh, at the top of your game. So we'll be back in just a moment, everybody. All right. Hey, everyone. We're back, and we're back for the CE Hot Seat segment. Hannah, are you ready to go on the hot seat? I'm ready. Okay, so here we go. First, first question, um, which we like to share every single time, is uh, you know what kind of are there any rituals that you practice each day? So this could be something that you do in the morning, maybe something you do at lunch, maybe even in the evening, or maybe all three times. But there, you know things that you do that really you feel really contribute to your success and and being able to be sustained in success in your professional endeavors. Um, yeah, so I feel like since the pandemic, it's been a work in progress. I can't say that I have a, a ritual per se, but I do stand usually at my desk. Um, I've had some, some back issues. And so 
um, it's kind of forced me into it a little bit, but I, I enjoy standing because I think it keeps me more energized throughout the day. Um, you know, I, I remember sitting at a desk and tending to fall asleep sometimes even. And so standing, you can't fall asleep standing unless you're really tired. So <laughs> I feel like that's, that's probably my most, um, consistent thing that I've been doing lately. Okay. Well, uh, that's a good ritual to have as well. I think, uh, I think a lot of us have, have gone down that road as, you know, of course I'm, I'm sitting right now. I think you are as well. <laughs> but right. Yeah. No, I'm in a different place right now. Not yeah, it's the same thing. My, my work desk is over to my right and that's a stand up desk. So I'll be uh, standing after we get done here. So that's a great, great <laughs> um, you know, another kind of the second question we always ask all of our guests is, you know, is, is there a book that you might recommend to, to all the listeners, you know, one that, that either, you know, was recommended to you that you read that you found was impactful or one that maybe you share with others and say, hey, here's a book that I think, you know, professionally you should read this because it's going to really benefit you. So any, any books that are in your, in your library that you think people need to, need to take a look at? <laughs> I'm admittedly not a bookworm. Um, I mostly listen to audiobooks and they're usually like uh, comedians or autobiographical, um, that kind of thing, like while I'm traveling. Um, I do have one non-technical recommendation um, that I have been recommending quite a bit, actually, since I read it. Um, it's called Attached, uh, and so it's about, it's actually about relationships, um, and it's about the attachment theory, hmm. um, and so that's, that's kind of getting into more uh, non-civil engineering <laughs> related territory, but but yeah, if, uh, if anybody has relationship issues or just wants to learn more about um, kind of the inner workings of, of people's relationships, that's, that's a really good one that I, I, I think has helped a lot of people, including myself. <laughs> uh, that's great. I mean, that's a, that, I mean, those are the recommendations because at the end of the day, I mean, we're in civil engineering, which is, you know, really societally vote focused. And of course, relationships are, you know, quite frankly, relationships is the glue that keeps all of us together, whether it's in right. business or personal. So I think that's a, that's a great, uh, a great piece of advice. I'll add that to my, right on my pad here to go look it up on. <laughs> um, so third question. So as you kind of think back over your career, um, you've had managers, you just shared with us that, you know, you've had, you've had, uh, you know, you've had in this case, you know, for you, you've had a, a, you know, a woman as a manager over, or, you know, for a good portion of your career, all of your career, but as you look back across all the different managers you've had, um, is there one of them that kind of sticks out, you know, don't share their name, but you know, one of them that sticks out about um, that, that really left you with, uh, you know, with a feeling of, hey, that, that, it, those are, they've got the attributes that I want to carry forward when I get into these, man into a management role. So, so is there anyone that, that, that left that imprint with you and, and what was it, what was that imprint that they left? Yeah, I would say, um, I have had some really good managers. So I've been lucky in that way. I think that um, they've been they've been good managers. I mean, they're good at managing people, keeping track of things. They're very organized. So, you know, those are the types of traits that uh, it sounds weird, but that I look up to um, because, you know, we're all kind of striving to, to be better um, at those kinds of things. But, um, and I think the other part is really being encouraged um, and always being provided with with new opportunities. That was something very, very important to me when I started at this company. Um, and it, I mean, the possibilities are seemingly en endless and, you know, it wouldn't be possible without that encouragement and that, um, you know, just openness and willingness for, for them to almost take a chance on you at first, right? Um, when you first start out. So that was I'm really lucky to have been given those opportunities because it's it's turned me into the engineer that I wanted to be. Oh, that's awesome. No, that's that's great. All right, so we got one one last question, and um, we call this the uh, the, the, the infamous uh, civil engineering elevator advice question. So so I, we're coming out of we're coming out of the pandemic. So this is a little more relevant now that we can get in. You're getting into an elevator. Okay. Um, Social distance rules are gone. So get, yeah, get into an elevator, no social distancing rules. And, uh, and, and you're in there with another civil engineer. You've got like 30 or 40 seconds uh, with them. And they say, hey, 
give me a piece of advice. You know, what, what's one piece of advice, whether it's professional, personal, um, that, that's going to contribute to their success? What's that piece of advice that you give them in 30 to 40 seconds? Mm -hmm. I think um, it really depends on what they want to do. Um, for me, I was really interested in getting um, all different kinds of experience, um, more of a broad spectrum. So I think that in that light, I would say take as many opportunities as you can that come your way um, in terms of type of work or even professional societies and, and joining groups like that. Um, you should be open to, to all those possibilities. And even if it sounds like something that you wouldn't expect or wouldn't want to do, try it. <laughs> um, you have to be open and, and be, being helpful, I think, is also important um, to, to really keep your management and supervisors in mind and, and try to, to assist them as best you can, whether you know, they're giving you project work or not. Um, if you can always try to keep in mind, you know, how can I help them? How can I um, you know, make their lives easier? Sure. Because that's what's going to help you succeed in the future. They're going to come back to you and they're going to, you know, have you in mind and in a good light um, because you get what you put in. And if you don't get what you put in, if you're not, if that's not being reciprocated, then it's time to think about moving on. <laughs> uh, it's great advice. You've actually shared a lot of um great um, advice bombs here throughout this session. So I can summarize it as as, you know, um, go for it, you know, go for the opportunity. I go for every opportunity uh, and be helpful. I think that that's amazing advice to be able to share. And I think it's useful for everybody that's listening. Uh, to so, and a reminder, even to myself, you know, be bold, go for it. So <laughs> Hannah, this is a great conversation. Wonderful, wonderful inputs here. I've got a book I got to go look up now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Re-energized on uh, you know on uh, on some advice here to to be successful uh, in the career and I and I hope that everyone else who's who's joined us and is listening to this um, is walking away with um, you know with some motivation as well. Um, so thanks a lot uh, for for being here. Uh, people might want to reach out and connect with you or learn more about the the wonderful things that Wood is doing in the in the PFAS arena. So beside going to the Wood uh, you know Wood uh, website. You know, where else might they want to go look to, to try to get some more information, either connect with you or, or just get more information in general about the work that you're doing? Sure. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the best place to find me. Okay. Um, and Wood obviously has, um, you know, websites and things. We've got a, a site specifically that, that talks a little bit about the, the project that I'm working on, but there's also the, the settlement website. Um, so if you want to look that up, you can just look at um, Minnesota settlement, PFAS settlement, <laughs> and that'll be pretty easy to find. But, but yeah, yeah. Uh, reach out to me um, if you want to connect. I'm on LinkedIn, Anna Alberta Spenham. All right, that's wonderful. And for uh, all the listeners out there, we'll uh, all the links for that will be down in the show notes, so you'll be able to navigate to that and click on them. So, Hannah, thanks again for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Wish you all the best. Absolutely. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can go find the show notes for it over at civilengineeringpodcast.com. That's civilengineeringpodcast, all one word, dot com. Look for episode 179. There you'll find links to all the uh, different websites we mentioned, books. Uh, you can find out more about the project that uh, Hannah discussed in the interview, as well as uh, just general information about PFAS and PFOA. Until next time, I wish you all the best in your civil engineering endeavors.